on the plant explosion out of West Texas. Investigators tell us it's still too early to know how many people were killed. But we do know a little bit about some of those who did not make it. One of the victims that we're hearing about is Jerry Chapman. He worked as a waiter for the Black Eyed Pea restaurant in Hillsboro, and his manager sent us this picture. They will have a memorial for him tomorrow. Learning, too, about Captain Kenny Harris. He was from the Dallas Fire Rescue and lived in West. He was off duty at the time, but he heard the call and rushed to help. The department does not believe he was involved in the firefighting, but did rush to help, as we mentioned, and he leaves behind a wife and three grown sons. We are hearing stories of um, hope and survival from several of the witnesses, too. This morning, we're sharing a story from a woman who rescued her own mother. Our Sophia Beausoleil joins us live from West this morning with her story. Hi, Sophia. Good morning, Brian and Sally. You know, those stories really are remarkable, and I have Miss Susie Price here with me today. So where were you exactly when you heard the blast? Sophia, I was uh, sitting in my living room uh, in my house um, just south of where all of the blast took place, and I was actually watching a, a survivor, <laughs> and um, I was just relaxing and sitting there and I had my windows open and all, all of a sudden this sound and it just shook and uh, I jumped up and I thought what the world because I'd seen the fire department the volunteer fire department go out for that didn't think much about it you know I lived just a few blocks from the volunteer fire department in West and so I'm always kind of looking when I hear the sirens. And so we, I noticed all of a sudden the smoke, the billowing in the sky, and every, everybody ran out of their houses to see what was going on. And when I saw where it was, I became very concerned because my mother, uh, my 91-year-old mother, is in the nursing home. And I picked up the phone immediately and started calling, got my keys, started that direction. And I really didn't know what was going on or what to expect, but I thought, I've got to get her out of there. You know, this is way too close for comfort. So I just took off, and on the way is when I started seeing all of these sites that I was totally unprepared for. Houses on fire, people running in the street. So I actually made a U-turn to go check on the fire and go around the back way to get to my mom's, uh, where her, her room was. And when I got there, there were people everywhere, nurses outside, bleeding. Her window was already uh, imploded, and the ceiling was down on her, her <coughs> self, excuse me, and her roommate, which a 103-year-old lady. 103 this year. 103-year-old roommate. She was next to your mother. Uh, describe to me just kind of what you did to get your mom out of that room. Well, since I had turned around and taken a little more time about the fire and the other people that were in the street, my aunt had already arrived at the room. She found a gentleman at whom I couldn't tell you if I saw him standing here. I think his name was Hutira. She got him to crawl over the bushes in through the window and, and get my mom up. And the other lady had um, a lot of debris covering her. The ceiling had fallen on to her. So she was covered up pretty much, really calm. Those ladies were calm. I couldn't believe it. I was more freaked out. And, and I'm sorry, but, you know, I just want to hear real quick before we have to go, just how exactly is the town getting through this? You told me yesterday that you know people who have passed away, and that's just so tough. Uh, what exactly is just kind of moving the town to the next phase of coping? Well, I think now that the real reality is really beginning to set in, and we'll start learning uh, who the casualties are and how many. Um, I think everybody's just going to try to stick together uh, and, you know, take it from here and try to just start trying to become normal, whatever that is, again. And I think everybody's, I'm just, for myself, when I woke up this morning, it was nice to wake up and go, I'm actually in my home, it's not destroyed, my mother's alive. We have bumps, bruises, and glass uh, 
on her, but she's doing remarkably well. So we're just going to all be, you know, pulling together and, and uh, wishing each other the, you know, bless everybody that's made it through this and pray for all those families that did not. And I just feel totally blessed that my mother and I and my relatives are are able to see another day and well, hopefully help everyone else. Well, we thank you so much, Susie, for being here with us dark and early. We really appreciate you telling us your story. And uh, Brian and Sally, we'll put on our website, but there are many ways that people in the community can give back to those here in West. Guys, back to you. All right, thank you, Sophia. A town of just 2,800 people. It is a multi-generational uh, farming community and a very close-knit community. And immediately after such events like this, people are looking for some type of comparison to put it in perspective. So I wanted to give that to you. One of the best examples that we can give you is that um, it happened back in 1995, 18 years ago today. You know, the bombing in Oklahoma City. 168 people were killed when a rental truck loaded with explosives and fertilizer was parked outside the obliterating one of the whole side of the building there. Now to compare that was one a rental truck with a ton of fertilizer. But the blast that we're talking about in West had 25 times that amount on site. 